You are now tuned in to the Storm Tracker Podcast. Welcome back to the Storm Tracker Podcast. I'm Marcus Benjamin, chilling with my guy Frank Tucker, representing the crib, Florida, and at the crib, like we are every Wednesdays here on this podcast. Of course, collectively, we represent canescounty.com, part of the rivals.com network. Make sure you subscribe to canescounty.com. Use the promo code MIME30 for the first 30 days for free. Also, subscribe to this podcast on all platforms and also subscribe to the YouTube channel live from Canes County. Frank, we are in the aftermath of a 2-0 season so far and Miami's big win over Texas A&M. And we both predicted Miami would win, but I, I don't think anyone would predict the actual score or scoring 48 points against the Aggies. It was certainly surprising for me and for many, but does this really kind of change your perspective on the Miami Hurricanes and, and kind of their outlook for the season? They have a favorable uh, schedule uh, for for the rest of the season here, so I'm pretty sure they'll be a lot better than five and seven. But what's your outlook on, on the Miami Hurricanes now that they dismantled the Aggies last Saturday? Yeah, the outlook has definitely changed. I think going into this year, everybody had an idea the defense was going to be pretty solid. They had Camp Kinchins on the back end. You brought Francisco Mauano in at middle linebacker. Wesley Besaint, another year older. James Williams, healthier. The defensive line had some really good pieces. Overall, it was a good unit. You know, Lance Gidry was really well respected around college football. So he knew the defense was going to be solid, and they've played up to par through two games. But the offense was a really pleasant surprise against Texas A&M. To, to see Tyler Van Dyke just really take a hold of the role of being the face of the Miami Hurricanes football program was so fun to see. 48 points, something we haven't seen at Miami unless they're playing teams like Bethune-Cookman, who they're playing this week. It's it was it was exciting. You and I were in, in the press box and just watching and just wowed by not only the abilities that were put on display by Van Dyke, but the play calling from Shannon Dawson. It, yeah. it, there was times in the game where he could have just kind of ran the clock out and just you know hoped hoped and prayed for a win with a, yeah. with a solid lead, but instead he went for the jugular, made some you know tough play calls where he was making making taking chances down the field with Tyler Van Dyke and receivers. And you saw it with kind of the back-breaking blow to Jacoby George for 64 yards at the end of that game, so with about three minutes left. So I, I, I loved what I saw. I think it makes things a, a lot easier to see a potential for 10 wins uh, than it is for six or seven. You know, before we were, we were a little nervous and kind of putting things like seven and a half, eight, for the year, I think this kind of puts things a little bit closer to nine with potential for more. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. I, I really feel like after this game, I'm like, okay, well, this team can beat all the teams that they are supposed to beat on this schedule. And this schedule, like I said, is favorable, man. You've got a Virginia team that doesn't look very good, a Boston College team that doesn't look very good, Temple is a, is a very – very winnable game and Georgia Tech also not looking very good. So uh, I think this is a team that should definitely dominate in some games that should impose their will. Uh, and the strengths of this team travel, you know, uh, as far as like the offensive line play, the running game, the defensive line play. I think that's going to continue from what we saw with these first two games. And like you said, with Shannon Dawson, he, you know, was still attacking at the end of this game when he didn't necessarily have to. And and one of the things that he said in the press conference this week was basically, hey, if you go conservative, that's how you get beat. I loved hearing that, Frank. I, I loved hearing something like that from your offensive coordinator because at times Mario Cristobal's teams at Oregon would go conservative. And that was kind of like a concern of him 
um, you know, coming over to Miami? Would his teams get conservative and would he lose games late? And that doesn't seem like that's the case at all, especially with the chemistry that you see with Shannon Dawson and Tyler Van Dyke. So the three big games that are left on, on this on this schedule, I mean, I hate to look ahead because that's like a cardinal rule. You're not supposed to do that. Take one game at a time. We all hear that type of coach speak every day, right? But you, you can't help but to look ahead to UNC, FSU, and Clemson. These three games will determine if Miami, dare I say it, is back or not. And let's start with that first game, UNC. I mean, on the road, their first real road test, although they will go on the road to Temple next Saturday. How do you think that game turns out, knowing what you know about the Hurricanes and the Tar Heels right now? Well, the Tar Heels didn't look great last week against App State. And they didn't get approval for one of their best offensive weapons that transferred in this offseason from the NCAA. So, yes, is Drake May one of the best players in college football, regardless of position, and probably a top five pick in next year's draft? Absolutely. Do they have some really good players on their team? Uh, yes. But the fact that they don't look thoroughly dominant against a team like App State, who, while good, is being – play calls by Frank Ponce, who couldn't cut it here at Miami last year with the offense of ineptitude that was 2022. So I, I like where Miami's at heading into that game. There is potential that Miami's 5-0 and heading into that contest. It looks like Miami has the potential to be really balanced on offense going into that game. You just saw a game week one where they ran for 250 yards, and then we saw a game where Tyler Van Dyke almost totals 400 yards against a SEC-ranked opponent. So I, I love yeah. what this offense is capable of. I think that they worked out some kinks on special teams. It's going to be the Xavier Restrepo show. Maybe no touchdowns uh, on punt returns, uh, but we're going to get safety there. Rashard Smith showed that he's got some game-breaking ability. And overall, the defense has depth um, that I'm really proud of because we saw Branson Dean and Akeem Mesidor go out of that game. And we probably don't see Akeem Mesidor for that North Carolina game, depending on the severity of that injury. So I, I feel really good where Miami's at going into, you know, looking forward to that North Carolina game. Florida State, that's the number three team in the country right now. I know it's always going to be a rivalry game. And that means that you got a chance just because of emotions. But right now, they're obviously going to be the favorite over over Miami, who's still working their way back. Are they top 25 in the country now? Absolutely. That's a beautiful thing to see. They got the probably the biggest win in the 10-year Mario Cristobal thus far. But there's still some work Man, to be no done. Problem. They have That's to... definitely the win. <laughs> yeah. So, hey, listen, you got it. You have to get to the point where you are 5-0 and going into North Carolina. And you have to knock off North Carolina because if you don't, say you lose to – say you lose along the way. Say you stumble at some point. You're not beating Florida State because they are a good team. Do they have weaknesses? Absolutely. Is Jordan Travis a perfect quarterback? No. Just a couple of years ago, Miami was putting it on him pretty bad. And I think that they're a beatable team, right? That LSU win, while solid – LSU's a bad team in my opinion. Last year they had the potential to – to be really bad. Like they, they were in a dog fight with an Auburn team led by Cadillac Williams as head coach. It, it, I'm not I'm not completely blown away by a win over LSU. Brian Kelly to me is one of the most overrated coaches in college football. So I think Miami's gonna have a chance going into that game. They're not gonna be the favorite right now. And then touching on Clemson, I love where Miami's at going into this Clemson game. I think this is the fall of Clemson in 2023. They look absolutely horrible, and they finally dropped out of the top 25. That That's a ridiculous statement right, when you talk about Clemson football. We're talking about a team that just was considered – was just had a team that was considered one of the greatest of all time, right? And year in and year out, they were getting the number one quarterback in the country out of high school. And they were also recruiting at a high level beyond that. And Dabo Sweeney was being talked about the same way we're talking about Kirby Smart right now. 
So the fact that they're just taking a huge fall from grace is a testament to the opportunity that is in place for Miami going into what is going to be a late season game against Clemson uh, that they've never won. Right. That, that that's the game that got out golden fire. That's the game that has embarrassed Miami every year. Right. That was that was the game that they put a fork in Miami in the ACC championship game. So overall, like this is a chance to get back. I think Miami wants that game really bad because even if you lose that Florida State game and you beat Clemson, you got a chance to be 11 and one really realistically. Do you know how crazy that is to go from 11? That's a TCU type. What TCU did last year, what everybody was saying Mario Cristobal didn't do, is what he would be doing, right? Of being an 11 1 team after the travesty of 2022, I think that would probably put Mario in the conversation for coach of the year. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, if I could just give my two cents on those three games as well, I think that UNC game is definitely a winnable game because, you know, we saw how vulnerable the UNC defense was again against an app state. Uh, I mean, you did talk about Frank Ponce and I mean, to give him a little bit of grace, he was the quarterback's coach. He wasn't really the OC down here. So I, I think he was limited in what he could do. Um, but, you know, to counter my own point would be that uh, the quarterbacks didn't really take that next step in, in that, in their development either. So, to see a team like that put up big points on the Tar Heels makes me feel good about Miami's chances overall. I think the key to that game is going to be just stopping Drake May from running the football because he can not only throw it with precision, but he has timely runs and he can get big chunk yards against the defense like we saw last year against the Hurricanes. And Clemson, yeah, Clemson – they're down bad, man. They're down bad. Just like this is like the end of of Clemson and Alabama. It feels like it, it's like a total, total shift in the the powers that be in college football. Georgia, it seems like they're definitely the new Alabama, and Alabama took a bad L um, at home to Texas uh, last week. So, yeah, the fact that Clemson was dropped out of the top 25 after beating a team 66 to 17 kind of tells you everything that you need to know about the perception about the Dabo's Tigers right now. And and Florida State, I mean, you bring you bring up um, some good valid points about LSU, but as, as weak as as Miami's schedule is, it's not as weak as Florida State's schedule. Florida State schedule is is a weaker schedule, in my opinion, than than Miami's. Uh, they don't really have any, uh, you know, really big time teams on the schedule. Um, they've got they've got Clemson, just like Miami. They do have a Duke team that has been impressive. I mean, they beat Clemson by three touchdowns, so that's going to be a tough out. But other than that, it seems like these other games are very winnable for Florida State. So. I think the perception of Florida State is going to be blown up or blown out of proportion based on their record um, going into that game against Miami in early November. should be a good one. But um, it, it is crazy, Frank, to kind of think that this team can possibly go 11-1. and one. But when you look at their schedule, it's definitely possible. With, with these two coordinators, with the talent that you have, I mean, you really got, just got to see what the level of attrition is as, as the season goes on. Like, who who are you going to have in those big games? Are you going to be relatively healthy in those big games? Are you going to have your five offensive linemen still intact uh, for that Florida State game? As uh, Shannon Dawson kind of raved about them, as so did Tyler Van Dyke. I mean, they did an outstanding job and Tyler Van Dyke has yet to be sacked after two games. So if, if they're able to sustain injuries, I mean, it's hard to think that, that this team, you know, won't be in every game that they play. So, and, and there's an opportunity for you to even get back game in the ACC championship where if they lose to Florida state and then, and if they run the table, 
they may have a chance to right their wrongs in that game. So this season is is, is going to be exciting just to kind of see it all unfold. But first things first, right, Frank? Uh, one game at a time, and the next game up is Bethune. So they play Bethune-Cookman on Thursday night, <laughs> 7.30. Yeah, it, it, it's a game, and we have to, you know, cover it or, or, or talk about it. Um, so, you know, I, I expect this game to be a blowout. And similar to last season where they beat them 70-13, to 13, and this team, to me, is – you could say five times better than than last year's team uh, based on the personnel and the coaching. So rather than kind of talk about the game itself, uh, we know this is a game that we're going to see a lot of players sub in and out, a lot of young guys. So the question is more so who gets more playing time here? And let's start at the quarterback position because we know Tyler Van Dyke obviously is going to start. And if, they, if they're up by four to five touchdowns, He's going to be out of the game. And next up, as we saw in game one, is Emery Williams. But who ends up playing more here? Emery Williams or do we see a rejuvenation of Jakari Brown in this one? I think you're going to see a pretty even split, but I do think we're going to see more of Emery Williams. Uh, listen, I think the staff likes – Jakari Brown, I think he's a good player. I think he brings versatility to this offense with his legs, but he's not there as a passer yet. And it's pretty evident by the opportunities that have been provided to Emory Williams uh, through camp and since he's arrived at the University of Miami. If you talk to people inside the program, they do feel like Emory Williams has the potential to be the future of this Miami Hurricanes football team. Uh, he, he has... I mean, he was three of three. It's a small sample size in, in, the, in his first game of college football. In the spring game, he was extremely efficient, really made some good throws, and was overall better than Jakari Brown against a the same defense, basically. So I, I honestly love what I saw out of Emory. And despite you know some of the flashes we saw from Jakari, I just don't know if he's a fit in what this offense is, right? You saw Shannon Brown – and I mean, uh, Shannon Dawson – in the offense that he wants to utilize um, here at University of Miami. And there's not a lot of quarterback runs that are involved in that. Could that be because Tyler Van Dyke is more of a, is more of your total prototypical pocket passer? Yes. But at the same time, air raid concepts, you want to get the ball out quick. Um, do they utilize some power in their offense and, and inside zone and outside zone type concepts? Yes. But overall, I just, I don't know. I think we're going to see more of Emory Brown, and I think he's going to shine through a little bit brighter than Jakari as well. Yeah, I, I think we're going to see a, a lot more of Emory as well. Um, but I do want to see Jakari play well. You know, uh, I'm, I'm I'm hoping to to, to see some kind of flash uh, from him, um, you know, in this game, just, just to kind of, you know, see some progress from him because, you know, he, he's a dynamic athlete as you see on this highlight. I mean, he's, he, he can be very explosive and uh, especially when he's running the football, it's just, you know, it's, it's really, can he pass the ball efficiently? Can he find the open man? Can he look, like he's commanding the offense because we really see that in the spring and we didn't see that in the scrimmage either. So hopefully he kind of makes, makes some progress and we see that from Jakari uh, come Thursday night. Uh, but um, I, I anticipate we'll see a lot of both of them, especially in the second half of that game. But um, another player that I'm kind of hoping will kind of, show up this season is Jaleel Skinner, man. Jaleel Skinner is a player that has basically been invisible the, this, this entire season. Um, even in the scrimmage, I think he was targeted once and didn't make the catch. Um, didn't, I don't think he had a catch in the spring game either. And um, it, it was, it's just puzzling to kind of see 
not only Julio Skinner, but the tight end position kind of disappear. I think um, they've got two catches in two games, one from Riley Williams and one from Cam uh, McCormick. So when it comes to pass catchers, uh, and we're going to see a lot of different pass catchers in this one, I'm assuming. Jaleel Skinner, or are we going to see a, a little Frank Ladson uh, action as well? We haven't seen him this season a, as well. So who do you think gets more playing time, Jaleel Skinner or Frank Ladson? I think we're going to see more Jaleel Skinner because I don't think we're going to see much of Frank Ladson. I, I just <laughs> – I don't know. There's still some young talent at the receiver position that hasn't really been utilized. I think we're going to see a lot of Isaiah Horton in this game. They're going to try to use this as more of a confidence booster for him. I know he had the big touchdown against Texas Santa, but I think that was his only catch of the game. Um, so overall, I think they want to get him going because, listen, you spoke about it. Attrition is something that happens in college football. You don't want to go down Jacoby George with an injury or a quick or a Colby Young with an injury. And then you're kind of looking like last year with the receiving core where you don't really know who's going to be that, that other guy to step up out of Xavier Restrepo and the one other outside option. It's nice to be able to have a balanced approach where you don't have to rely on just one guy. We saw in the first half, it was the Colby Young show, five catches, 67 yards and a touchdown. And then in the second half, I think he had one catch for like eight yards. But it was Xavier Restrepo balling. It was Jacoby George balling. Three touchdowns overall in that game. So I think they're going to try to get Isaiah Horton going. I think we're going to see a lot of, uh, you know, guys like Robbie Washington, people like that. Um, but overall, I, I think they're going to try to get, um, you know, a couple of the transfers involved. I, I just don't think Frank Ladson's really in the plans. He hasn't really panned out since he's got here. I do think that they're going to utilize Jaleel a little bit. He's a younger player that this would be a perfect moment for him to prove a little something. Um, but it is still going to be tough for him because we have seen this tight end position become a blocking type position in this offense. Cam yeah. McCormick has shined in that role. And Riley Williams looks a little bit better in that type of position than Jaleel so far. Yeah, I think what was telling of me uh, putting those two players together is that um, – the tight end position is pretty much, you know, uh, I, I don't want to say decided, but you know, it, it it's not a question of who's going to get those snaps at the start of this game. Clearly it's going to be Cam McCormick for much of the first and second quarter. And then we'll see Riley Williams, the freshman uh, get in there after him uh, because I'm assuming of course, Elijah Royo, no, no, no reason to really kind of play him in this game since he's recovering from an injury what we who we will see is, is nathaniel ray ray joseph I, I know he will out snap easily both of those guys when I, when we talk about skinner and Lass. maybe combined maybe combined <laughs> <laughs> yeah definitely um so the safety position is an interesting one because obviously cam kitchens will still be recovering from you know from his head injury and and not going to play in this one and maybe for a couple of weeks so we're still hoping he returns very soon uh but the safety position you know who who's going to start there because you know the obvious candidates for me are Jaden Harris and Mark Keith Williams alongside James Williams who do you think gets more playing time on Thursday night I was shocked to see Jaden Harris go out there first once Cam got hurt I thought it was Marquise Williams all the way. We've heard all the hype this offseason, right? He was yeah. the guy that was stepping up when James was, was injured. You saw 15 out there, an awful lot in the scheme. And then Cam gets hurt, and it's 19 out there. Uh, yeah. So, listen, he's a former cornerback that has some really good coverage abilities. Um, I think he's probably going to be the guy that starts just based on what we saw in the last game. But I do yeah. think Marquise Williams plays a lot. Yeah. From everything I've heard, that's the plan is, you know, obviously you bring in Zaquan Patterson and you have some guys like Isaiah Thomas and Dylan Day who are in the future plans. But Marquise Williams is a guy that they really like. He's a young player. He's got really good length. Uh, he's been learning under the tutelage of Cam Kitchens now for two years. So uh, overall, I think he's going to get a lot of reps, but I'm going to go Jaden Harris to start this game. 
Yeah, I'm going to agree with you just based on what we saw in that last game. And he was in on special teams, too, making plays. Jaden Harris was. So, yeah, I, I haven't seen much of Markeith Williams yet uh, this season. So um, we'll, we'll see if he gets more snaps than Markeith Williams. He might end up getting more snaps towards the end of the game, but we'll see how it all plays out. Now, corner is an interesting one now. Uh, you know, for this team because, you know, Jaden Harris is now kind of locked down CB1, I, I think, out of nowhere. I think people thought he would be the star position. We thought he was going to be a starter, but it seems like he is CB1 with Daryl Porter, DP2, as CB2. And at that uh, star position, it seems like it's to Corey Couch. It seems like he's, he's the guy who kind of is locking down that position, which – Leaves two more cornerbacks, um, you know, who have, have gotten playing time, I, I guess, you know, a little bit sparingly here and there. And that's Devontae Brown and Jadias Richard. We we could throw Damari Brown in, in that mix, too. Um, which one of those DBs do you think ends up having more snaps at the end of the night Thursday? Devont Devontae Brown. He had a rough Texas A&M game, like that, just to say the least, right? It, yeah. First off, the official depth chart came out, and I'm pretty sure he was supposed to be starting in that game. And we see Jaden Davis come out and playing all the reps at, at that outside corner spot. And we kind of hinted at it in the offseason. We, were, we heard rumors a little bit that he was told that he was going to get an opportunity to play on the outside that he was not going to just have to play that nickel role that he did at Oklahoma. But it wasn't something that we saw a lot in practice, right, That or, or any of the scrimmages. He was playing that nickel role, trying to replace the Corey Couch is what it from, look, you know, what, from what it looked. So Devontae Brown is still like that next guy up. We saw him get in a lot in the game in the second half. He obviously had two PIs, which were – really bad he because he was in position. He didn't have to make those plays. I think there's a confidence issue right now with Devontae. I don't think it's an injury thing. I don't think it's an ability thing. I just think it's a confidence thing. I think he has the ability to be one of those guys that could really contribute in this defensive backfield. He's just got to get it back, and this is the perfect game to do just that. Um, Shadias Richard, I think they're still trying to figure out a position for him. It, we haven't seen much of him at all. Um he, we know that he's explosive as an athlete. He's sub eleven hundred speed. He's six foot two, two hundred pounds. Is he a safety or is he a corner? We know he, he did all right at Vanderbilt, but that was Vanderbilt, and you played a bad Gators team last year that went four and eight, and that was your shining moment. So I still think it's Devonte Brown, just based on experience and opportunity expectations for him coming into this year were much higher. Um, so I, I'm going to go with Devonte. And I think you're going to see a split uh, with Damari that probably leans closer to Damari between him and Jadias Richard. All right. I agree with you there. I'll just move on to the next uh, two that we want to compare. And that's two freshmen. And that's Robbie Washington, two fast freshmen, Robbie Washington and Chris Johnson Jr. We have yet to see either of them uh, on the field at all. And I think this is a game that actually Chris Johnson kind of gets loose here, to be honest, because you know, he uh, still the word is still out on 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 Mark Fletcher and 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 if he's going to come back sooner than later, but very likely probably not going to play in this game. I don't see any reason why they would want to overrun a Henry Parrish or Don Chaney Jr. So I imagine you're going to see a lot of maybe AJ Allen and Chris Johnson Jr. But Robbie has a chance to finally get on the field too. Who do you think gets more snaps out of those two guys? Give me Chris Johnson. I think he he gives us one of those Chris John signature Chris Johnson sixty plus yard touchdown runs in this game. I, I, everything I'm hearing is that he is chomping at the bit to get on the field. He is healthy from what I've been told, um, and he looks good. And we know the ability that he has. And I think he's kind of in a perfect spot because you're seeing an injury from Mark Fletcher, right? Henry Parrish probably doesn't want to be putting too much wear and tear on his body in a Bethune-Cookman type game. A.J. Allen looks good, but I do think that they're not going to put a lot on him just because if Mark isn't completely healthy, you're going to need A.J. Allen over the next few games. 
sure. especially that North Carolina game. And he does have an injury history with him as well. He broke his collarbone the year before. So I think we're going to see some Chris Johnson in this one. I, and yeah. I'm really excited to see it. I, yeah. I don't think they want to put the guys like Don Chaney and, and an A.J. Allen and Henry Parrish at risk. There's no reason to against Bethune Cookman. And last year they scored 70 with bad with bad play calling. With Shannon Dawson, this might get ugly quick. It could get <laughs> really bad. So yeah. I, I love the idea of Chris Johnson finally finally getting the opportunity to show what he can do, sh- showcase that elite speed that made him the fastest player in the state of Florida over a two-year span. And I, I'm, I'm excited to see what he does. I hope Robbie gets in. I just feel like there's a little bit more competition. Tyler Harrell, we haven't seen anything from yet. Shamar Kirk, we haven't seen anything from yet. Rashard Smith is going to probably want to get some get some burn at, at slot receiver in this game. Obviously, Ray Ray is going to get some reps. There's just a little bit more competition at those slot receiver spots for me than there is the running back for Chris Johnson. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you there. And um, we'll see. We'll see how it all unfolds. Um, you know, I'm pretty sure it's going to be a – 40 or 50 or so or higher point margin in this one. At least we hope. And if it's not, oh, my God, that'll be terrible. And then uh, we'll be back on, you know, feeling miserable about Miami. (laughs) But uh, I doubt that happens on Thursday night. Um, So we'll move on to some recruiting news. Armando Blunt, the five-star 2025 defensive end out of Miami Central, announced his top five. Uh, recently, and it was Oklahoma, Florida State, Ohio State, USC, and of course, Miami. Now, this is a kid who is just absolutely dynamic uh, in in every sense of the word. word. Uh, He is just powerful, quick, just, you know, he's got it all, and he's every bit of the five-star rating that he's receiving on rivals and, and pretty much all platforms. And this, this is a, this is a guy that was a, a, a visitee at the game last week and enjoyed himself and was, you know, made it known publicly that he was enjoying himself uh, on social media. So, you know, from what I hear, uh, Miami's in a really good spot here uh, for, for Armando Blunt and um, his decision could be coming very very soon as well from from what i hear so and and this is a kid who could possibly reclass as well from what i hear he he has a a few classes left and you know to be honest he doesn't have a lot else to prove in high school i mean he he's on a of course a really good team in miami central they still have a chance of course to win a state championship like every year uh which is something that he doesn't have on his resume as of yet. But, um, you know, besides that, and if, if they do go on to win a state title, then, you know, I could, I could totally see him reclassifying and jumping into the 2024 class. And, you know, if that happens and if Miami is able to land uh, a talented player like him, then it puts this, this, this class and, and the future of Miami in a really, really great place because he's got that uh, Ruben Bain type of ability. You know, he's he he can beat you a, a variety of ways. He can hit you with a bull rush or speed rush, and he's just super aggressive getting to the football. So um, interesting to kind of see where it, where it all, how it all folds or uh, plays out. But your opinion on Armando Blunt's top five announcement and his potential future? Yeah, I don't think everybody's in the race in that top five. I think he just wanted to put five in there. And yeah, I, I, I think Miami's in a really good spot. Uh, they've done a really good job recruiting him. Jason Taylor become the def- becoming the defensive ends coach is obviously huge for any defensive lineman. There's a reason that Marquise Lightfoot and Elias Rudolph, outside of just NIL opportunities, considered Miami. Um, those are two of the elite defensive ends in the country, and they chose Miami in that 2024 class. 2025, I, I think it's going to be a lot of the same, right? You're, you're going to get guys like Randy Adarico who are going to really consider Miami. You're going to get Armando Blunt, who's really going to consider
Sorry about that. Um, you're gonna get you're gonna get a lot of the top defensive ends in that 2025 class. Really looking at Miami, and we saw it with the amount of visitors that came for that Texas A&M game. You can still look at our visitors list that's on the website. It, right. it was a number of it was a number of top guys, and they have all raved about how Miami looked. And listen, when you have a Hall of Famer that is is leading the charge, it's going to help. Um, so I, I, I like where Miami's at. Him being at Miami Central only helps things. Randy Adarika, you know, having Miami as his top school only helps things. And, you know, having a Reuben Bain as well as several central influences on the staff is only going to help things as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Miami is already reaping the benefits of that Texas A&M win with landing Wayden Charles to the 2025 class as a receiver that I – Lots. And there's se- and there's several guys that have tried to tap in. Miami, one thing I want fans to understand is Miami is not letting everybody commit right now. There, there are a lot of people that want to be part of this Miami program. There are a yes. lot of guys in 2024 that are that are wanting to be a part of this Miami program that they could have got. If they wanted to get Chris Cole, they probably could have got Chris Cole, right? Like there, there's a number of guys that went other directions that Miami hasn't necessarily pushed – as hard for because there are 22 commits right now. It is whale hunting as whale hunting comes. And I think that the 2025 class is going to be really special. You kicked it off the blue chip quarterback. Now you have a top 150 player at receiver uh, who's from South Florida. There's so much talent in 2025. Um, You know, the the linebacker class is going to be really special. If you can add an Armando Blunt, that means you have the number one defense, arguably the number one defensive player in the country for the class. Like things could be really special for Miami. If they go, if they win nine or more games this year, watch out for you talked about Alabama and Clemson kind of take, you know, going by the wayside. Things are going to change in college football if Miami wins nine or 10 games this year. Yeah, definitely. Things are just changing in college football. It just seems like it's going back to the early 2000s with Miami, Texas, USC. Like these are the programs that are starting to come back. And I think Miami is going to continue that trend, of course, if they continue to win like they did Saturday. So lastly, just kind of wanted to talk a little high school football, as we always do here at the crib. Uh, big game coming up on Friday, Frank. We got American Heritage. This is a big game every year. American Heritage against Chaminade. You know, um, I missed the game last year because um, I was in Houston for it. Uh, I was in at Texas A&M for the Texas A&M game that weekend. Um, but you got a chance to see that game last year. Uh, Tamari Brown, who's, of course, now Miami Hurricane, was in that game. Uh you know, but it's, it's a star-studded event with three Miami Hurricane commits playing in this one with Malachi Tony on the American Heritage side, as well as Aquan Patterson and JoJo Trader. Hopefully, we get to see him uh, in this one. So, what are you what are you most excited to see in this game? I'm excited to see the four stars nobody talks about. Right, you got Kyle Washington, you got Jaquari Trig Lewis, uh, you got on the on the heritage side, Dia Bell, newly minted number one dual threat quarterback in the country, newly minted yeah. four star top. How about that? Let's talk about that. Hold, how about that though? Dia Bell, the number one dual threat quarterback. D, I mean, I mean, I like him, but it just seems like wow, is 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 he that good in your eyes? He's very good. He's he's around six foot three now. We know the athletic ability he has. He averages 20 points per game in basketball. Uh, he's looked really good through the start of this year. They've played, you know, some two national, nationally ranked teams uh, in Trinity Christian and St. John's, and he dismantled both of them. Yeah. The connection he has with Malachi Tony is really special, and he has a really good group around him outside of that. You know, two blue chip running backs. Uh, two, they're, they're both top 150 players. Sure. And Byron Lewis and DeAndre Desinor. You got Brandon Bennett, who's one of the fastest kids in the state. Zamari Sanders, one of the fastest kids in the state. Coy, 
uh, Jafar Jean uh, Lewis, who's one of the who's a really good route runner for his age. Already got some Power Five offers. He'll probably be a kid okay. that ends up on Miami's radar before it's all said and done. Yeah. Uh, but overall, like, there's just a lot of talent on the field, a lot of young talent on the field that Miami has already got their hands on. Right, Greg Zay Thomas at cornerback, 2025 kid, six foot two, 195 pound corner that. Looks like he might be next up. Uh, you got, you know, a couple other kids just overall. Like, listen, Bull, Davion Bullet Gals, if he continues to do what he do, he does. And, you know, that Purple Machine group continues to transition to Miami. I wouldn't be surprised to see him be one of those names that pop up a little bit later in the cycle as a f- potential flip from North Carolina. He's top 15 running back in the country. He kind of fits that mold of Mark Fletcher as a power back who has retooled his body. Overall, man, there's just so much talent on the field. Chris Ewald is another guy in Miami, has at the top of their board, Michigan commit. We see a lot of the issues going on in Michigan right now, potential investigation coming for them with recruiting violations, yeah. right? If that thing's, if that if things open up for him, he is best friends with Zaquan Patterson, has been to Miami sure. several times. He was there you last know, weekend. He was there last weekend with his father, right? Like, there's just so – like. Plays on that DEFCON 7-on-7 seven seven team that just seems to keep adding my Hurricanes, you know, to the roster, right? So, <laughs> I, I honestly, like, I, it's just going to be one of those fun games to watch. Like, if you're a fan, you should be fighting to get into this game. It's on yeah. Thursday night. Nobody else has anything else to do. It, it's, you know, it's Friday night, Friday night. I, I'm sorry. I'm, yeah, the yeah. rest of the games are Thursday night. But Friday yeah. night, this game, you know, make – Make this a priority because it's going to be a good one. They call this a respectful rivalry, right? It doesn't ever get ugly. It doesn't ever get really too chippy. But just two really well-coached teams that annually are competing for state championships. And there is blue-chip talent literally almost at every position. So it's this is going to be one of the better games of the year. Chaminade is, is just so dominant this season. You, they played a top-20 team in Virgin Catholic last week. And beat them 61 to 21. Just dismantled them. Jeremiah Smith in two and a half quarters over 300 yards and three touchdowns. That's insane. And it, yeah, it's just, <laughs> I don't think, I think Heritage knows enough about Jeremiah Smith to, to not allow that to happen, but we will see because honestly, it's, it's hard to stop him. And yeah. he's another guy that, listen, I keep trying to tell everybody, I keep trying to hint at it. Miami is still in the race here. He has been rumored to want. He's rumored to be at three different games this season to check Miami out. He was tweeting about the game at the end of it, right? You saw James Williams going after him. You saw Xavier Restrepo going after him. Like you got upperclassmen that are recruiting Jeremiah Smith. Everybody knows the talent that he is. And if you bring in a receiver group that's Jeremiah Smith, Chance Robinson, and Jer- and Josiah Trader. With Wade and Charles coming in behind him, and then you oh. grab a Nashawn Montgomery and a Josh Moore or a Cortez yeah. Mills, right? Yeah. Like we're gonna and be then talking a Malachi about Tony him. after him. <laughs> and then a Malachi Tony after him with the Calvin Russell, yeah. right? Like it, like it's just Miami is in a prime position to really just completely flip this receiver room. And you can credit Kobe Young, Xavier Shuffle, and Jacoby George, plus the play calling of Shannon Dawson for a huge part of that. And yeah. I do think Miami's in a really good spot with Jeremiah Smith. I'm going out on a limb and saying that I don't think he ends up at Ohio State. Wow. I think that it's I think it's going to be a Florida State or Miami. And Ooh. I think it's going to be a fun race down down the down the road over these next few months. Wow. I mean it just it just seems like Florida State is I mean I hate to mention them since it's a Miami podcast, but uh Florida State is another one of those teams that is getting back to greatness along with USC, uh Texas and Miami. Um and they seem to always be in a battle with Miami for top recruits. Miami, you know, one out for Zaquan Patterson, uh Florida State one out for several other players. Um, but Miami it, got Josiah, Josiah Trader. Yeah, they got, like, they got Josiah Trader as well. Yeah, uh, Ricky Knight ended up going to Florida State as one of those guys. But um, Florida State and Miami seem to also be battling for Armando Blunt. I, I think it's a top two, uh, top two uh, race, top two school race there. And then, like you said, now with JJ, it's another 
FSU Miami battle if he doesn't commit to Ohio State, which would shock the world. But you had it here first on the Storm Tracker podcast. The other player uh, you didn't mention that I wanted to mention from that American Heritage Chaminade game is Xavier Lucas, man. That the Wisconsin commit. I think this is a game where he can actually show what Miami missed out on because I think he, I think he feels some kind of way about it, you know, um, that, you know, they weren't on him. Um, uh, the, the previous regime was, and then once they made some changes with steel, uh, they kind of backed off of him for some reason. Um, oddly enough, he ends up at Wisconsin or is committed to Wisconsin at the moment. But I think he has a chance to to really show out on a big stage, especially with JJ, you know, the, the receiver of all receivers right now on the high school ranks. So look out for that matchup going into this one. So um of course, you know, we'll 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 see who who you think is gonna win this game. Who do you think is gonna win this game? So Shaman, I don't I, <laughs> I'm not gonna be able to predict the Shaman I lost. Yeah. Uh, Pretty much all year, it's going to be a tough one. I, I don't think that they really have a challenge in front of them until they play Miami Central. Uh, I know this is a rivalry game, and Heritage has a lot of talent, but they are still very young. They're still yeah. very young, and and Chaminade is just a beast right now. You have five blue chip receipt, five blue chip receivers. <laughs> yeah, that is ridiculous. Daenerys Gray okay. just got minted as a four star, top one hundred player. They have five players at receiver <laughs> that are four star or higher ranked players. That yeah. is ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. don't see you don't see some power five programs with five blue chip receivers in their roster. Right. That that is ridiculous. With a four star quarterback throwing to them and a four star running back running the ball, and yeah. then arguably the top freshman running back in the state of Florida running behind him. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's it is just insane, and I can't pick against Shamana either because of the experience. You know me; I, I always kind of look at the quarterback first, and you know, uh, I, I just give the experience edge and the talent edge to Shamana in, in this one. So um, I do think it's going to be close because you know Heritage is always a well coached team, and they always game plan games well. Uh, but it's going to be hard to game plan against, like you said, five blue chip receivers, a blue chip QB, a couple of blue chip running backs. And let's not forget the five star Miami commit, Zaquan Patterson, always lurking. So it's going to be tough to beat for Heritage. The, the other game that I, I do want to talk about, I know you want to talk about as well, is Western against St. Thomas. St. Thomas. Pulled out a questionable game last week. I mean, I was there, so, you know, it was – to me, it was just a bad officiating by the refs, you know, but at the same time, St. Thomas did go out and win the game in the end, you know, with a big play from Miami Commit Chance Robinson. Uh, I think they have something to prove because of that game was so close and they had to kind of battle throughout to win it. Again, and then they're playing against a, a, a Western team who is also playing a chip on the shoulder with uh, taking an L last week to Coconut Creek, which I said last week, Frank. I did say that Coconut Creek. You needed, you needed <laughs> some. You needed some external <laughs> factors to happen there. For it true, to happen, true, but. true. But a, a, a win's a win. A loss is a loss. I guess you could say. But um, as I understand it, um, Kobe. Howard is is questionable for this one. The Miami uh, Titans. He's probably going to be end up being suspended based on his ex- ejection from the last game. Um, you know, depending on what happens, you know, there was just a slight altercation. And sometimes refs, you South Florida referees, like to take things into your own hands in a way that you probably shouldn't. And unfortunately, right, just like we saw with St. Thomas Aquinas, they are not held accountable for what happens to them right like they make these decisions and it affects children it affects people's jobs as high school coaches sure so i think this was just another example of of a referee overstepping their boundaries you know this is a game of football where things get emotional and things happen um there was no brawl there was no situation where somebody was injured 
So I, I, I think that referees overstep their boundaries this, with this one. And if I go out on a limb, I'm going to say that if I ever see the referees that call called that ejection, we're going to have an issue. So, you know, it is <laughs> what it is. But, uh, you know, Western, Western's got a lot of talent on their team. Uh, you know, they got they got several, you know, linebackers with a number of power five offers. Um, they got Davi Belford at quarterback still. Uh, Caleb Hermain is one of the top tight ends in the 2026 class with over double digits so far. So they got some talent. You know, this is a, a rivalry game as well, kind of like battle battle of Davy type thing. Um, so honestly, uh, it's going to be a, it's going to be a, a good game to watch. Um, the other game is probably a little bit better than the Western one. This is Columbus Palmetto. Yeah, definitely. That yeah, I was going to get to that game. It's an interesting one because you know you you got Jacory Barney who's been kind of lighting it up. I mean, from last year he was playing several positions last year, and he's kind of taken that to another level this year, playing quarterback. I've seen him line up at running back as well, and we all know what kind of outstanding receiver he is. Uh, they went out and beat Homestead. I mean, and Homestead is no slouch. Uh, they're they're still one of the contenders to, I think, to to win a state championship. So it'd be interesting if they can keep that going against a well coached Columbus team. And they beat also, Lakewood too. They beat, they beat, beat a, Lakewood. Yeah, yeah. Lakewood is always a always a good team coming out of the Tampa Bay area. And um, you know, Dalen Russell, uh, the Miami commit is is you know, the defensive tackle uh, for Columbus. So it uh, should be a very interesting game. Where do you think it goes? Um, I this Listen, every time these two teams play, it's like a three to seven point result. So yeah. Yeah. I, I think I think that Columbus is probably going to pull it out. Um, I have them among my top five teams in South Florida now. Um, I haven't dropped the rankings, so we there's not much to talk about with that. But I do have Columbus in my top five. Um, I have Paul Meadow moving their way I've up as well. I've been saying that. I've been saying that about Columbus since the beginning, bro. I was they're just like, no, it's not Columbus. They're a top five team, man. Listen, they're just super well coached. They have, in my opinion, the most technically sound linebacker in the state, Hector Chavez, who is yeah. a Miami target. He's a guy that was on the visitors list uh, sure. for last weekend's game uh, at Texas A&M. Oh. His film is astounding. And if he was six foot tall, he'd probably be a – blue chip linebacker. So um, lo- excited to, to see what he does against a really good Palmetto team. Um, you also have Trajan Bandy's little brother, Jeff Bandy out there covering wearing, wearing number one. He's playing really good football. Um, you know, on the, on the offensive side, Alberto Mendoza doing really good things. Jose Leon is a stud. He was actually at a visitor for the Miami game on Saturday. Uh, Bryce Fitzgerald, one of the best in 2025 and a top Miami target at yep. safety um you know if you could combine if you could bring in a db group that cj ewall dj pickett uh naeem offered at cornerback and then bryce fitzgerald i'm, oh, I'm smelling i'm smelling silver with the national championship rings so um you know i, I think it's going to be an exciting game though i think it's going to be two teams with really good defenses um uh, that are going to battle it out and they this is not a respectful rivalry. This is not a American Heritage shot. Yeah. They this are going to be nasty. <laughs> this game is going to get nasty. This game is going to be fun to watch. If I wasn't out of town for a family engagement, I would be there on Saturday. But you will be there. You will be there. You will be giving updates uh, for everybody. And uh, so that means you have to follow Benjamin Rivals uh on twitter just so you can know what's going on in that columbus palmetto game which is going to be a barn burner yep certainly is i uh, can't wait to see it can't wait to see all the football this weekend i'll be exhausted but you know i this this is what i signed up for man i, I can't wait to see what young players for miami Shanad, and heritage is should be a good one and then palmetto columbus i'm anticipating that one to be another classic so that's going to wrap it up for the storm tracker podcast once again make sure you ride to canescounty.com for free use the promo code miami30 also subscribe to this youtube channel live from canes county so subscribe to the podcast as well on all platforms make sure you like share and comment as well we'd love to hear from you we'd love to hear from you on the message boards as well 
on Kane's talk. A lot of good stuff on there as well. My and Frank are all, always putting uh, recruiting nuggets in there and just analysis and just kind of stimulating conversation with, with polls and questions. So make sure you subscribe to canescounty.com, part of the Rivals Network. Until the next episode of the Storm Tracker Podcast.